Coming up on DTNS, how your behavior has changed while you stay at home regarding tablets and smart speakers. Walmart takes on Amazon in fast grocery delivery, and Robert Heron's here to help you up your home theater speaker game. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 1st, 2020, International Workers' Day in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Robert Heron, display analyst, co-host of AVXL. So good to have you back on the show, man. My pleasure. Good to be here. Good, good to, to see have... you guys. Uh, we were just talking about doing things for yourself from uh, building uh, your own chest freezer to cars uh, on Good Day Internet. Become a <laughs> member. Get that uh, conversation at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Speaking of building things, Microsoft opened registration for its virtual build conference, making registration free for all attendees. The event will feature uh, opening remarks by CEO Satya Nadella, the usual keynotes to start the conference with 48-hour workshops streamed on Twitch. The 48-hour event will start May 19th at 8 a.m. Pacific time. The in-person build conference required a 2,395 entry fee last year. A little different now. Yeah, cheaper. Reddit's vice president of product community, Alex Lee, announced that the company is rolling back the start chatting feature we talked about on yesterday's show. Uh, Lee cited several errors with the launch, including a bug that would show a starting chatting button on all subreddits, even those not part of the initial rollout. Uh, some of the subreddits don't want this feature, and they were annoyed by that. Lee also said Reddit will give subreddit moderators the ability to opt out of having the feature appear in their communities. And in a statement to The Verge, Reddit said they will reassess the rollout plan and evolve the product to meet the needs of our community. The board of ICANN voted to reject the sale of the .org registry to Ethos Capital, citing concerns on how Ethos would use the registry to pay down the $300 million in debt that the acquisition would require. The Internet Society currently manages the .org public interest registry and announced plans for the sale back in November. The deal also faced scrutiny from California Attorney General Xavier Becerra, as well as several ICANN founding members. The U.S. House Judiciary Committee called Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos to testify before Congress whether Amazon's Associate General Counsel Nate Sutton lied when he claimed Amazon did not use third-party seller data to develop its own products. Sutton said that to Congress. Now Congress is... I guess they didn't want to ask Sutton because he might just lie again, so they're going to ask Bezos. Wall Street Journal reported April 24th that Amazon employees are using such data for such purposes. Amazon released a statement last week saying it does not believe the claims made in the Wall Street Journal article are true. NVIDIA chief scientist Bill Daly released an open source ventilator hardware design called OPVent or OpVent. The ventilator can be made with off the shelf parts that cost less than $400. It uses a solenoid valve to control airflow and flow meter for precision delivery. The design is yet to be cleared by the US FDA and Daly is seeking manufacturing partners till to make it at scale. In an interview with CNBC, Xbox chief Phil Spencer said the launch of the Xbox Series X is still on schedule for a holiday release this year, but that game production is the big unknown. Some titles for the console, like Wasteland 3 and Minecraft Dungeons, have already been delayed due to work disruptions uh, from sheltering in place, with Halo Infinite the only first-party title that is confirmed to launch on the Xbox Series X. Microsoft is hosting an online event next week to highlight third-party games for the console, so we'll find out what will come at that point. Epic Games announced the cancellation of the 2020 Fortnite World Cup, citing the limitations of cross-region online competition, making it impossible, at least for now. The company will continue to support third-party events, but these and all other Fortnite events will remain online until further notice. All right, we gave you the top line of Apple's earnings uh, yesterday. Let's talk a little bit more about what's going on with them. Uh, revenue growth last quarter of 1% year over year, which normally would be a disastrous report, but with overcoming shutdowns to Apple's stores worldwide in March and in China in February, along with disruptions to the supply chain, is being seen as a, a fairly decent report. Uh, wearables revenue rose 23% on the year. iPhone, iPad, and Mac sales decreased 7%, 10%, 
and 3%, respectively. Sales in China fell $1 billion year over year. Uh, but of course, the majority of the quarter uh, was with China in lockdown. Only the very end of the quarter was in lockdown in other parts of the world. Service revenue was the big bright spot, rising $2.2 billion to $13.3 billion. Apple said it reached 515 million subscribers across all of its offerings, music, TV, etc. With Apple News up to 125 million monthly active users. Apple CFO Luca Maestri did say that Apple Care and Apple Advertising, part of the service revenue, would be negatively affected in the next quarter, lowering that revenue. Uh, Tim Cook said that sales were recovering in the second half of April. The supply chain was, in his world's full throttle at the end of March. Apple has opened stores in China, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at this point, has plans to reopen stores in Austria and Australia in one to two weeks, followed by a few stores in the United States sometime by the first half of May. And Apple employees are not going to return to the Cupertino offices until early June at the earliest. Uh, early June would be the, the soonest that they go back to the main campus. So uh, some good news and, and some, some tepid news there, but nothing horrible. Yeah, it seems like when you look at, you know, the fact that Apple is so, so reliant on a supply chain that is that runs smoothly and looks really far ahead into the future, this might be a blip, a blip quarter. Uh, you know, it, the fact that uh, Apple, uh, you know, took a big hit in China. Yeah, it might just be, well, for those three months, you know, a lot of people did, or a lot of companies did, rather. Uh, the fact that wearables are way up is that's, you know, a bright spot. And that's been a trend that's been continuing for quarters now. And yeah, I mean, if, if by the end of this year, we've kind of caught up and iPhone shipments, even if it's, uh, even if they, well, if they, if they indeed are announced and, and unveiled when we expect them to be yeah, a short delay or, you know, maybe a staggered delay for, for various models is not unheard of. Apple's done it before would, would kind of, you know, it would kind of show Apple's like, all right, well, you know, we, we could sort of figure this thing out because we had looked so far in the future. Yeah. I mean, China, uh, the China market, uh, saw Huawei grow its market share and Apple grow its market share, which is, which is good news. That's according to Canalys. Um, and yeah, uh, Apple won't forecast their next quarter, though. They won't give guidance on what they think is going to happen, because as good as all this sounds, it relies on the economy coming back into full swing. And uh, Robert, I don't know if you have anything to add before we move on, but that, that kind of is the big question mark for all these companies. For me personally, it's more about the workers who are being hired and how many of them actually have things like basic health care. It's, it's nice that Amazon's providing protective equipment. And, and yeah, they've increased their pay, but I think more important for a lot of people right now would be to have a job that actually covers you in terms of your health care providing and having that squared away without it costing you a fortune. So, well, and we're talking about Apple here, not Amazon. So oh. uh, in that case, uh, it seems like Apple's been doing a pretty good job of, of keeping people online. If, if, if at all doing anything, it seems to be they've furloughed a few people, but they haven't laid anybody off. And exactly. And as far as, I guess, for Amazon, though, in we haven't got to workers. we haven't got to Amazon. Hold your thoughts on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then I will shut up. We, I have nothing to add then to Apple. <laughs> we 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 I assure you in just a few it's minutes we good. will be talking about Amazon at length. But let's talk about a uh, Amazon competitor first. Walmart confirmed plans to launch a new grocery service called Express, which would provide a two hour or less grocery delivery for an additional ten dollar fee. That kind of sounds familiar, like another kind of delivery service. Doesn't it? The service has been in testing in 100 U.S. stores since mid-April, and Walmart plans to expand to 1,000 stores by early May, expanding to more than 2,000 in the coming weeks. Express delivery slots will be available when traditional delivery isn't available same day or even days out, but Walmart says it won't push back standard delivery orders to make capacity for Express. Aha! Walmart says... We see you, Amazon, and we raise you not doing that. <laughs> yeah, uh, this this is a smart move by Walmart to take advantage uh, of Amazon's uh, inability to to keep up with the demand and say, hey, there's there's more demand than they can deal with. Let's take some of that on. Uh, the only way this backfires is if Walmart can't meet that demand. If suddenly you're like, hey, I heard Walmart, I'm paying this additional fee, and now I can't get the grocery delivered to me that uh, I expected to, but um, a bold move by Walmart uh, to try to get into that technology logistics fast delivery situation at a time when a lot of people need this. They, they, a lot of people need grocery delivery. 
All right, let's talk about Amazon. Uh, Amazon reported revenue rose 26% last quarter. Subscription revenue rose 28%. Advertising revenue was up 44%. AWS cloud service revenue rose 33%. But profits dropped to $2.5 billion from $3.6 billion last year. Well, that's odd. They're making hand over fist money. Why aren't they profiting off of it? Well, Amazon says this is not going to get better. They're forecasting a 28% rise in revenue next quarter, but a quarterly loss for the first time in five years. Jeff Bezos expects to spend $4 billion or more in the current quarter on COVID-19 related expenses. And that's where the disconnect is. Yes, they're bringing in more money than ever, but they are spending that money, they say, on protecting the workers. Amazon hired 175,000 people this quarter. That's a lot. Uh, that's an increased expense alone. They say they spent 300 million this quarter to develop virus testing capability. Amazon has also raised warehouse worker pay and is paying for the protective equipment, uh, masks and such. It also notes warehouse efficiency has dropped as it attempts to maintain social distancing at work sites. So that's part of the reason that they're having delays with their shipping. Amazon Prime's goal of one day shipping hasn't been canceled, but they have put it off until later this year. They're like, we're probably not gonna get to that Q2, maybe Q3, maybe later. So before we get to the worker side of this, Robert, how do you feel about Amazon saying, look, we're, we're gonna be going back to the old ways of not having a profit margin because we wanna spend this money on protecting workers? That is a good thing, without a doubt. I mean, this is one of the richest companies in the world in terms of how much money they pull in. And even during, say, a lockdown situation, Amazon Web Services are still chugging away. I know many people still working from home, working on projects or services that depend on AWS. And for that, uh, it's the least they can do. And I would, I would hope that more people simply pay attention to the workers themselves in terms of any kind of collective voice they may have, in terms of anything they might need, in terms of just basic services. It could be anything like improved healthcare and hopefully like they're saying the ability to develop improved testing for that many workers especially in warehouse environments where distancing may not always be an option and it would be good to just know that at least your co-workers have been checked and everyone's got a good assessment of how they're feeling well and it's a good example of like you mentioned tom it's like they're raking in so much money you know and it's easy to kind of be like okay, well, if Amazon's out of everything, that that means demand is up. So like it's complicated behind the scenes, but they're still coming out ahead. Well, Amazon spent a long time building to become the company that worked really well until a few months ago. So what happens to what, what, what all the scrambling that, that has to happen behind the scenes, it costs money and it takes time and they're not out of the woods yet. And yeah, it's, it's, we are seeing the, you know, talking about quarters and, and profits and, and financial outlooks. This is a great example of a very, very successful company that's had to, you know, really go back to the drawing board. Yeah. And it's Jeff Bezos mode of operations to, to spend money close to the bone, uh, to do what it takes to get profitable. They did that in uh, for for the entire 2000s in order to get to those five years of having profitability. I remember we joked on DTNS the first time Amazon record, reported an actual profit rather than a squeezed profit margin uh, that was like, oh my gosh, the day has come. That has become the norm, but now they're going back to it for a different reason. Uh, and, and short of accusing Amazon of committing securities fraud, uh, one would assume that they are spending this money. Uh, they're, they're not pretending to spend the money. So you could think if you're listening to Amazon's side that the workers must be pretty happy that they're spending all this money to take care of them, but they're not. Uh, and in fact, it's not just the workers from Amazon who are upset and worried about the safety of their workplace. May 1st today is International Workers' Day. And employees not only from Amazon and Amazon's Whole Foods, but Instacart, FedEx, Target, Shipt, and Walmart have joined in a work stoppage to protest working conditions. Instacart workers want better distribution of protective equipment. They say they've been told they'll get it, but they're not getting it. Whole Foods employees are calling to have locations with positive cases shut down for 14 days to prevent infection of other workers. Amazon delivery service partners are asking for professional cleaners to sanitize vehicles at the end of each shift rather than having the drivers do it themselves. Amazon employees are asking the company to be transparent about the number of cases at Amazon facilities. Amazon is informing directly the workers affected, but they're not going public. 
In response, Amazon said that masks, temperature checks, hand sanitizer, increased time off, increased pay, and more are standard across Amazon and Whole Foods market networks already. Target told Wired the concerns come from a very small minority. Instacart said it has already invested nearly $20 million in the last few weeks to support the health and safety of the shoppers. Now, we're talking about work stoppage today in the thousands. It's not nobody. Uh, and and even the most optimistic is not putting it at the tens of thousands. So you could be forgiven for saying, well, that's not very many people. Uh, as a, a percentage of the workforces of Amazon, Whole Foods, FedEx, Target, Shipped, and Walmart, it's a very small percentage of the people. But the point of these kinds of protests is often to get attention for the problem. You don't have to have a lot of people out there to get a company to change. So the question then is, do we do we think that it's a case of the company wants to do the right thing. It's just taking time to get, we know how hard it is for frontline workers and healthcare facilities to get masks and stuff. Is it just taking long time for Instacart and others to get this stuff? Uh, or are the companies dragging their heels and they should do better? I mean, I think in many cases, the companies, uh, and they're, we're talking to companies of various sizes and they do things differently, but companies saying, well, we've put a lot of security measures in place and the workers are like, we're the ones working here. We assure you, you are not doing enough. We do not feel healthy. We do not feel safe. So I think there's, in many cases, a disconnect. You know, Amazon saying, well, we've done all these things. This is all standard practice. Workers saying, well, people are getting sick in warehouses and we need to figure out, you know, how drivers shouldn't be wiping down trucks and doing it wrong. You know, there needs to be, uh, you know, professional people that step in at certain points. You can do better. And I think who is working on the front lines, I know that's a term that's thrown around a lot, but the front lines of companies like this, I mean, they, they are the people that you need to be listening to. Robert? I am in full support of everything just said. And I also think for folks, especially in my local community, the the shopping centers, the, the grocery stores in particular, are some of the places I worry about the most. And I have directly seen some employees not doing everything they could personally. And that makes me then wonder about the company themselves actually providing that training or the, the materials or the masks or whatever to keep them safe doing these literally a frontline job and anything, anything that can go toward making that a better situation has to be done. And it, it's this is a grand opportunity also just to to help the people who are in the most need and cannot speak for themselves, be it in some of these healthcare facilities we're seeing for extended care or, or places where people have to live for long term are mm -hmm. probably affected far more than most people realize. In addition to just, I see kids nowadays, uh, the young people I work with on a weekly basis, just wondering how the hell they're gonna get through this grade and what will come next, seeing how their ability even to sit at home and learn has been uh, an experiment at best and yep. not always working. I, I, I think it's easy to armchair quarterback this. And if you want to, to, to side with the company or if you want to side with the worker, uh, it's easy to accuse the other side of, of lying and not doing enough uh, or, or being disruptive and overrepresenting a problem. Uh, but if you actually want to get to the to the truth of this, if if we want to be able to trust that the people complaining are just the fact that there's always complainers and that what's being everything that can be done is being done, there just needs to be a lot more transparency, uh, especially from companies like Instacart, Target, Walmart, Amazon that are providing us essential goods. Uh, we as consumers, I think, want to know that the people that are delivering those are being taken care of, that they're going to stay healthy. Uh, not only are they not going to infect the package they're dropping off, but they're not infecting each other and putting themselves in more danger than they need to in order to make this work. So uh, wh whatever side you're on, I would like to see more of that uh, and, and more of that kind of transparency rather than just sniping in the public record. Totally. And this of morning... Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Just a quick mention. I will say my local uh, county, in terms of their health officer, put out a statement two days ago in terms of how we're going to be reopening our businesses here in the next month. Uh, some businesses will be allowed to reopen in a limited basis right now, but most of our businesses are still closed down. And I spent the better part of my morning putting together a document for the city to describe exactly how that interaction is going to take place and how we will keep people safe. And again, I'll go back to our health officer of this county 
did a really good job in preparing this document and providing some templates for people to use to say, okay, here are, here's a checklist of everything. What in that category are you doing for visitors and different types of businesses, depending on how you interact with people in the community. So I'm actually quite pleased with the local response so far and, uh, more power to them. Yeah, and it just goes to show how complex a situation this is. It's not dump a bunch of masks at the warehouse and say good luck, right? It takes a lot more than that. Totally, and they are they are focused on different types of businesses and, and who has more direct communication or direct interaction with your local community versus say somebody who is working from home generally or doing, uh, in my case, clientele work and business online as well. So thank you. <laughs> A couple of surveys are trying to get a sense of how tech usage has changed since the advent of COVID-19. A survey from NPR and Edison Research says 35% of U.S. smart speaker users are listening to more news and info, 36% listening to more music. Uh, that number gets bigger the younger you are, 18 to 34-year-olds, more like 50% and 52%. Smart speaker owners who work from home, more likely to request news, less likely than folks who are still going out to a work site uh, to ask for weather or time. Number of users considering buying a second smart speaker for kids has risen. It was 47% last spring. It's 71% now. And tablet usage is changing. Sensor Tower notes iPad downloads rose 40% in Q1, the first year-over-year -year growth in iPad app downloads since Q4 2013. Also, spending on iPad apps rose 16%, the biggest rise since Q4 2014. Games and entertainment lead, but education apps, as you might guess, came in third, topping 100 million downloads for the first time. So real quickly, round the horn, uh, does this uh, ring true to you, Robert? Oh, without a doubt. I, I only wish that if you're going to hand your kid a AI assistant, that it would somehow <laughs> enable some way to encourage them manners or asking and saying, <laughs> please, a simple, a simple tweak. <laughs> Sarah, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea of, and I, I know, if, especially for families and the kids being on the younger side, some pretty frustrated parents being like, I'm not a teacher. <laughs> Go do something, child. Um, and the, the image I have in my head of, you know, a little kid getting, you know, a, a speaker assistant and being like, what's four plus four? You know, and it's, it's amazing what you could probably stay entertained with and still learn something uh, using the limited AI that we have at our fingertips now. But yeah, I know for me, I'm in a particular room in my house, uh, kind of, you know, I work from home, but I'm in that room more than I would be if life was normal, quote unquote, right now. And so I am uh, interacting with my smart home more than I would. So yeah, I mean, all of this going up makes sense to me, particularly for news, um, because instead of commuting in your car and listening to your favorite, you know, news program or music or what have you, um, it's all happening in, in another place. Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Now, as we said, we're doing a lot more from home. Obviously, one of the things we're doing is, is watching TV, as we just heard, listening to music. Uh, everybody talking about the streaming services and the streaming boxes, and I do need a new, do I need a new TV? But what about your home theater sound? Robert, why would we want to upgrade our home theater sound? Because it is literally... I'd say more than 50% of the whole experience. I think it's even a greater impact than the visual. You can have a, a very tiny screen, like literally, literally this, your phone itself, but if you have a good pair of headphones on, it almost takes away that, that limitation of screen size itself. Also, you may have issues related to just the fact that TV speakers in general sound like crap, and they are, they are the least cheapest part, or they are the cheapest part on most TVs you'll find nowadays. So. If you have any kind of hearing issues whatsoever and clarity of voices to just overall sound is missing from your life, then it's definitely time for an upgrade. Also consider that folks like Netflix and other streaming providers, their in-house content nowadays is all being authored to multi-channel, three-dimensional Dolby Atmos audio in addition to the cool Dolby uh, Vision visuals. Now. Other streaming sources, as well as your broadcast sources and gaming services are also taking advantage of multi-channel sound. But even beyond that, it, it, if you're still stuck with the, just the TV speakers, it is, it is easy and affordable to do a good upgrade that will bring you daily joy. How do you uh, make sure you're getting the most out of what you've got from your TV? Well, it depends. Uh, for one, I think if you have one of the new premium TVs, 
take a look at some of the features that you may just simply have not explored. I'm more of a video guy, so I tend not to look at the audio options very often, but on a brand new TV I purchased uh, about six months ago, it turns out that the microphone built into the remote can act as a room audio correction device and actually help improve the TV's audio a little bit with the built-in speakers. And also take a look at the different sound modes that might be built into a TV. Some, like I mentioned, can be useful if you have any kind of hearing difficulties where, where voices and spoken dialogue aren't as, or aren't as pronounced as they could be. Uh, there are often sound modes that can enable that. Also, if you're trying to keep peace in the house, there are often compression or night mode listening uh, settings you can play with to help keep the boom to a minimum, but at the same point, if you want the best experience possible, make sure at least those things are turned off. A lot of folks are, are, are uh, sheltering in place alone uh, right now. They're, they're the only ones in their house, uh, but not everybody is, so you might want to invest in a pair of headphones. You may already own a pair, especially uh, maybe you have an older pair of Bluetooth headphones and your TV has Bluetooth audio built into it, and that can be a fantastic, convenient way to just simply enjoy a little privacy and, and take in that full experience from the content we enjoy so much. Be it you know your broadcasted news programs all the way to the best content from our, our beloved streaming providers. And, and in fact, even if you're in the house alone, you don't want to, if you've got headphones and you don't want to pay for new speakers, that might be a way to, to handle this too, because you don't have to worry about sharing the audio with anybody else. Uh, but sound bars are probably the most common way, right? Without a doubt. That's probably the easiest single upgrade uh, beyond what we'll talk about next. But for sound bars, I always find that no matter what brand you go with, they tend to always sound a little bit better if you are using a subwoofer with them. Often these will be just a wireless link to the original sound bar makes it really easy to set up. You can literally just plug these in and stick them in a the corner somewhere that they're out of the way, yet still provide that l low bass, low frequency rumble that can really is the part of the sound frequency that takes the most energy to reproduce. And it can often overwhelm lesser speakers. So pairing an okay sound bar with a decent sub or even a low cost sub, a good sub starts at a hundred bucks. But anyway, that, that can really go a long way toward just turning your, your regular presentations into something a little more special. Also, if you have a mounted TV, investigate mounting options for your soundbar. I find, depending on the position of the TV, you may find it desirable to have that soundbar on the top edge of the TV or the bottom edge. Uh, realize that there are affordable options for getting that hardware you need, universally speaking, to get that mounted just right. And also too, if you're dealing with an articulated mount that can angle left and right, it's nice to have that sound bar mounted so it's actually pointed in the direction that you're actually looking at it. And finally, if you are looking for some reviews and good guidance, I love the folks over at ratings.com, R-T-I-N-G-S.com. They do terrific testing and they have a great resource in terms of uh, the, how they actually do their testing as well as if you have Q&A, they dive right into it. And finally... Oh, yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, like, okay, if I want to find that sub one hundred dollar mythical soundbar that you mentioned, that would be the yeah. place I would look for it, right? But what if I'm like, I don't care, I want to stop messing around, I want the best. A couple options. One, there are premium soundbars, including features like Dolby Atmos support to provide a very convincing, at least greater than two channel audio experience. That I love. Also, some soundbars incorporate AI assistance that can make usability of your home theater gear kind of nice. It is sort of sweet to have an AI soundbar where it, you can just walk in the room and say, turn on the TV and it just comes on or play this content on that service and it just does it. That's pretty sweet. But in the end, if you really want the best room filling audio experience and you have the budget and the means, you really want to do something that supports Dolby Atmos. In particular, having the height channels, the speakers in the ceiling firing down at you is, is the most ideal setup there is. You can have anywhere from two to eight speakers above you with consumer hardware available today. And the first time you actually do the room calibration on something like that, either with the built-in tool in an Xbox or you're, you're running your favorite test from built into an AVR, it, it is... Fantastic. And like I said, with more streaming providers, which is one of the biggest ways we, we receive our content, moving towards these 3D audio formats and delivering them, and with the next gen ATSC standard coming up for just broadcast, improving 5.1 quality in that respect, 
it is never been a better time to have, at least as far as your TV is concerned, the best audio experience you can have. And it, and it hits just about any price point in style and configuration, depending on either your room size, budget, or what you're looking to do. Well, folks, uh, the only thing you have left to argue about now is what what is the best sound quality? What is What makes good sound quality? Sarah, where can they go to argue about that? Oh, our Discord, Tom. I never thought you'd ask. In fact, if you're not already in our Discord and you're like, I'd love to argue that's what I do best, then you and I should be friends. And you can also link to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's let's uh, let's play a little a little, a little um, a voice call from Allison Sheridan, friend of the show, frequent guest who has a recommendation for another podcast that might be worth your time for a very specific boat shaped reason. I have to admit that I'm getting a bit of fatigue listening to people talk about contact tracing by Google and Apple. Sorry, Tom. Anyway, when I started listening to text message 204 and Nate Langson said he was going to explain it, I actually started to switch to another podcast. But then Nate started it as a story of two fellows inexplicably named Jeff and boat-shaped head and how these two lovely gentlemen were near each other at a shoehorn shop. <laughs> I had to keep listening. If you haven't been able to wrap your head around how two phones can collect the necessary data to know who you've been near without invading your privacy and sharing your location, I have to highly recommend listening to Nate's story, even though you're going to have to figure out what somebody would look like with a boat-shaped head. Anyway, you can find text message at uktechshow.com or in your podcatcher of choice. That's fantastic. Yes, we love Nate. Uh, and you'll hear me talk about what's on DTNS uh, on text message as well. That's uktechshow.com. If you're a patron, you can even find out the backstory of the boat-shaped head person. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Kume wrote in and said, on the topic of AI's ownership of a patent and whether or not that's going to be possible ever, he says, well, he reminds us really of that monkey selfie. You know, the one famous among mm -hmm. photographers, kind of smiling, real cute. Because the photographer publicly said he let the monkeys take selfies, says Komei, he lost that copyright dispute. More importantly, the copyright office said it only works, that only works created by a human can be copy copyrighted under United States law, which excludes photographs and artwork created by animals or by machines without human intervention. Komei says, I don't know too much about patent or copyright laws, but isn't AI kind of like smart animals right now? Ooh, that's a good comparison. Copyright and patent are different. Komei acknowledges that. Uh, but could you say that, well, if an AI makes it, then nobody owns the patent. Again, Intellectual property lawyers, please respond to both this one and the one from right. yesterday. I'm very curious how you feel about all this. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Brad Schick, Paul Boyer, and Dustin Campbell. Len Peralta has been busily drawing today's show. Len, what have you drawn for us today? Well, you know, last summer I uh, took the plunge and I redid uh, my home theater system. And I got to say, I agree with Robert that the sound is amazing. Dolby Atmos is the way to go. Uh, I don't have a, a 7.2 or a 7.4, but I have a 5.1. And uh, the image I drew today is kind of a classic take on that old Maxell ad. Uh, this is also a, a, apologies to Bloom County's Burke Breathed here. It's the old uh, um, blown away uh, image of a little kid sitting there drinking a Capri Sun and a small little uh, speaker just kind of blowing him away there uh, because those are the size of the speakers I got real small they're just it doesn't matter if as long as you got really really good speakers um, the sound is going to be fantastic so uh, so yeah so this uh, image is available right now at uh, my patreon patreon.com forward slash len or also at my online store at lenperaltastore.com no. Oh. Will Max Sell be suing you for that? Oh, well, they'll have to sh sue uh, Burt oh, Breathitt as well. They'll have to <laughs> exist first. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Awesome. <laughs> good stuff, Len. Also, good stuff from Robert Heron. So nice to have you on the show with us today, Robert. Uh, you keep very busy. That's obvious. Where can people keep up with everything you do? Hey, follow me on Twitter, at Robert Heron, or check us out. Me and Patrick Norton are still doing ABXL. I'm actually backed up. I have two episodes that will be posted here as as soon as I freaking can. <laughs> and I'll be doing that uh, this week. But yeah, A-V-X-E-X-C-E-L.com if you want to find us there. 
From time to time, we've been taking this part at the end of the show to kind of send you to something else, a, a creative pursuit uh, worth uh, paying attention to. Jeff wrote in and said, I happen to be very lucky and I'm in a good situation during this pandemic. So I figured it was my duty to up my pledge and keep you all going and help out those who also love your show but aren't as fortunate to be able to continue to support. Please keep bringing the amazing daily content. Also, for Tom, I am a sci-fi fantasy nut and finally picked up Pilot X. That's a novel I wrote. Uh, he's, uh, Jeff says I'm about 75% through it, and wow, it is incredible. I can't wait until my work day is done and I can pick it up again. Oh. Uh, Jeff, you don't know how great that made me feel when I saw this. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, uh, if you want Pilot X or Trigger, uh, which is also a Pilot X adventure, you can go get it at tomsnewbook.com. If you got something you'd like to email us but just aren't sure where to send it, well, I have a solution for you. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. And if you'd like to join us live, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC is the time. Join us. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you Monday, folks. Have a good weekend. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>